Climate change is a global problem felt on local levels, as heat-trapping carbon dioxide is released by human activity into our atmosphere, it will linger for hundreds of years, warming our planet. We are feeling the impacts of these changes in our communities now, and we can expect impacts to continue and likely increase. Even if emissions are stabilized relatively soon, these effects will continue to last for many years, affecting future generations. Climate change is a 12 month, 24 hours a day, 365 day event. Is it gonna change? Well, it's already changed. How much it changes really depends on the rest of the world, on how serious they take this, and how serious they are about meeting their targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change adaptation is, I think at its core, it's adapting to the impacts of climate change and learning how to move forward in a changing environment. Because of these long-term effects, responding to climate change must involve the stabilization of greenhouse gases by reducing emissions, as well as strengthening our communities and altering the ways in which we live alongside the environment to adapt to the new challenges. This is called adaptation. Adaptation is a series of deliberate and comprehensive actions that a community takes to help avoid, manage, or reduce the effects of climate change on human and natural systems. To ensure adaptation measures are relevant and effective for communities, we need to translate scientific information and indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing into action and build regional capacity and adaptation expertise. This means working with indigenous peoples and governments, including community-based initiatives to build capacity for adaptation action and address the specific risks they face due to a changing climate. In the polar regions, global warming has been dramatically amplified compared to the rest of the world. The Arctic as a whole has warmed two and a half degrees Celsius over the last 100 years compared to global averages of slightly less than one degree. These changes are even more profound in the winter months where warming rates have been observed to be double or even triple the rates of summer warming. A warming atmosphere combined with a warming ocean has led to the melting of precious sea ice. Sea ice extent most rapidly decreases during the fall months and has been observed to be declining at a rate of about 13% per decade since 1979. These values are lower during the winter. Sea ice thickness is thinning at rates of up to 10 centimeters a year. Tackling this issue head on is Smart Ice. Winner of the 2016 Arctic Inspiration Prize and the United Nations Momentum for Change Climate Solutions Award. Smart Ice is a cross-sector social enterprise that works to integrate Inuit knowledge with sea ice data. So in the Arctic, the climate has been changing for the last decade. It's not something that's necessarily in the future. So I think we need adaptation happening now to allow people to cope with what these new conditions are, the unpredictability of changing climate. Smart Ice integrates sensors on the ice, so technology and Inuit knowledge to make sea ice travel safer. So it gives the information almost in real time in some cases, where is the ice dangerous? Where is it safe to travel on as normal? So Smart Ice is actually a working climate change adaptation tool. And I think what that does is put directly into the hands of the community what they need to do to address climate change. Located on the Labrador coast, Nain was the first location that Smart Ice developed and prototyped its stationary sea ice sensors. The project remains active in the community where it will provide the grounds for development of future sensor models. So, uh, I mean, we, we come from a small community and we hear about climate change all the time. The Labrador current is waters made up of all the water in the north and it flows down to the Labrador coast. If there's a change in a couple of degrees, it's amazing how much of an influence it has on our everyday lives. Like we see changes just overnight. One of the instruments that we use, uh, we call it the Smart Commodic. What we do is we try and get it out as soon as the ice forms, put the instrument in the ice, and then we just leave it and it freezes in. And then it distinguishes the temperature of the water, temperature of the sea ice, temperature of the snow, and temperature of the air, all one time. 
I think Smart has, has made a difference uh, so far because, um, I mean, we're not just talking about uh, knowledgeable people that uh, use the sea ice. Uh, we're also talking about uh, young people who don't have a lot of knowledge. So they have like hands-on with everything that we do and it gives them the opportunity to be out on the sea ice and they learn traditional skills. It's something that we continue to try and do and uh, hopefully we'll do it for many more years to come. Since 2000, scientists have recorded a 1.2 degrees Celsius temperature rise in the permafrost of northern Canada. Since 2008, seasonal thaw layers have been increasing across ice-rich permafrost in the Arctic, which is causing significant surface settlement and erosion. Il y a 50 ans, les ingénieurs, quand ils arrivaient dans les villages Inuit, voulaient construire, par exemple, je prends l'exemple des Kaluit. Les ingénieurs euh, pensaient que le sol essentiellement gelé pour toujours. On a construit des infrastructures en ayant une perception du sud. Puis malheureusement, on voit le changement climatique qui affecte le sol, donc la fondation même des villages puis des infrastructures qui commence à dégeler. On voit beaucoup de déformations dans les pistes d'aéroport, on voit beaucoup de déformations dans les maisons. On a fait des avancements majeurs en, en ingénierie du pergélisol. On s'en va dans la bonne direction, mais malheureusement, trop peu, trop tard, mais on s'adapte. Les chercheurs puis les, les communautés Inuit ont beaucoup d'expérience. Tout depuis 5-10 ans, donc on essaie de transmettre le savoir scientifique aux Inuit pour qu'eux puissent prendre leurs décisions. Parce qu'eux, ils voient le terrain, les changements climatiques, eux, ils le voient d'une façon différente que nous. Eux, ils vont le voir plutôt par des formes, ils vont le voir plutôt par euh, la migration des caribous. Euh, nous, on, on met des données, mais eux, c'est par le transfert de connaissances par les, les elders qui appellent dans les communautés. While communities and researchers rally behind climate change adaptation techniques, some organizations are laying the foundations for how community-driven research will help people make decisions about when and where they travel. In addition, the information will be documented, categorized, and made accessible to everyone. Working with Inuit and Cree communities living in Hudson Bay, the Arctic Eider Society's 2017 Google Impact Challenge project winner Siku is a first prototype. Siku is an Inuit knowledge Wikipedia and social mapping platform that's intended to provide self-determination for Inuit for research, education, and environmental stewardship. The idea is there's all these different data portals out there, but there really hasn't been an interface for Inuit that's by Inuit. So an example in our community, one of our elders, Peter Katuk, is out at the flow edge every day in the winter and he's been seeing the diets of seals change from Arctic cod to shrimp. He's seen it, so he has a data point every single day. And so now with a mobile app, he takes a photo of the stomach content, spatially tagged the photo, the photo's GPS reference, it can show up on the community's timeline. There's been a lot of precedent groups like uh, Facebook, Nunavut Hunting Stories of the Day, but they're giving up their intellectual property rights. And also if you want to mobilize that knowledge, it's near impossible. You'd have to scroll and scroll to try and find the hunting story you told last year, for example. So with Siku, it brings together all these social media mapping tools. So it's, it really helps with Inuit self-determination and research. So people can come up with their own questions and scientists don't have to second guess and prove everything that we already know to be true. So. As the effects of climate change continue to evolve, it remains uncertain exactly how each region of the North will be impacted. And although the impacts of this change may not fully be realized in our lifetimes, there is no doubt that communities across the North will continue to take innovative, proactive, and culturally sensitive steps towards adopting climate change adaptation techniques. I think that it's important to prepare communities to take advantage of opportunities that climate change brings. It's not always negative, it can be positive. We live in a different different world now versus say 20 years ago in the north so i think by using different technologies and stuff for say research the kids still get the traditional information and it guarantees that our traditional ways continues into the future there's so many opportunities across the board with adaptation and for you know anyone to bring it into what they're doing um, 
and also to be building um, healthier, stronger communities. Adaptation is that's you know the the goal of adaptation. And I think something that's extremely important for people to realize is that climate change is but one challenge amongst many, and it's not always the most important or pressing challenge. A healthy person, a person that is physically healthy, mentally healthy, a person who has strong identity, well, that's somebody who's going to have high capacity to adapt. Federal, provincial and territorial governments need to support vulnerable regions by investing in infrastructure, strengthening capacity, supporting community-based monitoring and advancing research, monitoring and information for coastal regions. Many communities are already implementing these best practices. Adaptation is an individual, communal and global responsibility.